Hello, hello, hello. This is Attorney Mike Grove. I'm coming to you from Chicago. As usual, I've got two good clips today. One very short, one very long. They're both very, very interesting, uh, and they were both sent to me by a lot of people. So thank you all for sending them to me. Also, I think it's Allison who sent t-shirts. I just want you to know I got them, both for me and Yesenia. I, I just want you to know that I have them. I, I'm going to try to do a stream with Yesenia where we both wear the t-shirts because they're cool. <laughs> all, right, all right, enough. Uh, for, we we, we got to get started here. We're going to kick it off at the Parkland uh, shooting trial. I have not been watching the trial. I am aware of the incident, uh, but everybody sent this to me. So we're, we're, we're going to open it up with that, and then we're going to move into a really interesting uh, sentencing in 3B. Let's do it. Yes, um, at this time the defense rests, other than putting in our records. <laughs> okay, so a bunch of people asked me, why is she mad? Uh, a lot of you already know, but uh, for, for people who aren't, aren't paying that close attention, the defense uh, rested, but they rested first thing in the morning. So they knew this the night before. And she's got a courtroom full of people. She's got a court reporter. She's got, she's got all those people there. She's got all these attorneys. Uh, just add up the billable hour sitting in that room right now. And nothing's happening today. Because she didn't tell the other side she was going to rest. She didn't tell the judge she was going to rest. The other side doesn't have any witnesses to get started. And it's a big waste of time. Having said that, it's the attorney's prerogative to rest when they want to rest. So th that's w that's how this starts. We're not playing chess. I mean, will you please take the jury back in? I think she meant chess, but she said chess, which I don't know. <laughs> okay, I need to grow up. Thank you. All right, go ahead and put in your records. Two B. Nicholas Cruz Henderson, episode one record. Let me, let me just stop. State, are you going to have anything ready for today? No. <laughs> We're, 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 us, there was 80 we're waiting for 40 more witnesses. I just want to say this is the most uncalled for, unprofessional way to try a case. You you all knew about this, and even if you didn't make your decision till this morning, to have 22 people plus all of this staff and every attorney march into court, be waiting as if it's some kind of game. Now I have to send them home. The state's not ready. They're not going to have a witness ready. We have another day wasted. I, I just, I honestly, I have never experienced a level of unprofessionalism in my career. It, it's unbelievable. Okay, so the, the way I see this is, I th th this is strange. This is really wild that she's doing this, and it appears she's doing it in the presence of the jury. That's that's what's what's crazy to me. Having said that, most judges wouldn't like this, and she also and the jurors don't like this. The jurors just had another day of their lives wasted because they're not progressing the trial, so they're still gonna they're still gonna be under all these constraints. So it's understandable why the judge is mad. It's also understandable why the defense attorney is mad. I, I, I'm just saying these things get chippy and nasty. It's a nasty case to begin with. It's long. I understand why both sides are upset. I'm not taking sides because I haven't watched it, so I don't know the nuances of, of who's really uh, who's really being who really deserves it here. But I understand why everyone's mad. So, Judge, you asked, if we had any pretrial matters, you asked us to be here at 9.15. We were here at 9.15 to discuss pretrial matters. I have been practicing in this county for 20 years. Uh, you know what? I, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Well, Judge, you're insulting me on the record in front of my client, and I believe that I should be able to Okay, you can do that later. You can put, make your record later. But you've been insulting me the I had I had this very thing, not by the judge, but by opposing counsel today, about took somebody's head off in the Daily Center. Uh, so I understand, and and you know, so she she's saying, you know, you're you're doing this in front of me. I'm an officer of the court. I've got a client sitting here, uh, so she's getting some pushback, which is understand understandable. And she says, fine, make your record. Uh, so I, like I said, I understand why both of them are upset. Entire trial, so blatantly taking your headphones off, arguing with me, um, storming out, coming late intentionally if you don't like my rulings. So, quite frankly, 
This has been long overdue. So please be seated. You can receive the evidence. I will receive the evidence. And then you can um, put whatever you want on the record at the end. This is file number 211936SN. It's entitled People of the State of Michigan versus Andrea Curtis Rothman. That's you? Yes. And you're here with your attorney, William C. Amadio. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Amado? Amadio, yes, that's right. Uh, this matter was previously before Judge Patterson. And Judge Patterson, in fact, took the no contest plea in this matter in July. And it was. There was a plea earlier in May, and I think that was withdrawn. It was recharged the defendant pled in July, no contest, before Judge Patterson, to moving violation causing a serious impairment of a bodily function and operating while intoxicated, the second offense, uh, as opposed to a felony with operating while intoxicated, causing a serious bodily violation. Uh, the matter was originally done as a pre-sentence investigation by Daniel Frazine from the prosecutor's office. Then Matt Huff from, uh, from the probation department also took a shot at this, trying to figure out what to do. In the course of a year, here in district court, we have thousands of routine cases, 3,000 driving suspended or no ops cases, a couple thousand retail frauds, a couple hundred drunk driving cases. And in the course of a year, you have about a dozen cases that are very difficult. And this sort of, this falls in that category. In fact, I just took a plea a few minutes ago in a felony case reduced to a misdemeanor moving violation causing a serious impairment of a bodily function, the one-year misdemeanor we're talking about here. I teach, and I said this in that, at New Judge School every year for about the past six two-year cycles, so about 12 years worth of teaching sentencing to brand new district judges. And I tell them that these are the most difficult kinds of cases we have to do a sentence on. This one is particularly difficult. I didn't really want this case, but I said I would accept it. I know Miss Curtis. I know her as Andrea Curtis. And uh, I won't say that we're social friends, but I know who she is. Her dad worked at the phone company. Her mom worked at the bank. Her brother used to work here at the courthouse. Um, but of course, Judge knows her, and uh, he he has he has some personal uh, views on on an event that happened at trivia night. As as we go, it's it's wild. Guy, then he worked to, went to Home Depot, and uh, I've known her as a person in the community, and she's a trivia fan, and I've seen her on a number of occasions at different venues that host trivia. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But I've never actually sat down and had a conversation with her. Uh, but if I'd had my druthers, this would not be mine. But it is mine, and we're going to figure out what to do. And we have a huge elephant in the room because her blood alcohol level is 0.15, and she says she had one drink. Both Daniel and mm -hmm. Matt took great effort to try to figure out what was going on here. And oh, both are left unfulfilled. Uh, Daniel is recommending a substantial jail sentence. Matt has determined that she isn't appropriate for our sobriety court program. One, because she doesn't live here. And two, because she doesn't acknowledge that she has an alcohol problem. Um, next, she has some serious and permanent debilitating injuries as a result of this accident as well. So this is a case without any readily obvious solution. So uh, I've read the file 
I've read the sentencing memorandum. I've read Ms. Rothney's letter to um, the injured party, Mr. Van Tassel. I know his family also. I don't think I know him. He's not here yet. So here we are. So we'll start with you, Mr. Amadio. What would you like me to know? Um, Your Honor, I did get a letter from her therapist, if, you, if I could approach with that. Yes. Just got that. And her list of medications. Thank you. I think in addition to the substance abuse, Oh, you're fine. Okay, I, cool. I, no, I just didn't get a copy for me. Okay. I don't want to get beat on YouTube. Like that's, you right. that's okay. <laughs> I won't. I won't attack you. So I think in addition to the medical conditions, Your Honor, there is some mental health issues that are relatively severe here. Um, when Prosecutor Davis contacted me to withdraw the plea, I contacted my client right away. She has cooperated as much as she could under the circumstances. Um, I think my sentencing memo speaks volumes on this. I don't think she's intentionally disregarding she's an alcohol problem, Judge. I think everybody's clear there's an alcohol problem, there's a mental health issue, and we also have a 61-year-old woman who has an abundance of physical issues. Now, granted, Judge, much of this has to do with her own actions in this accident, but I don't think she's a good candidate for jail. She is supported by her loved ones who's here today. She has children and grandchildren. She's been an asset to this community her whole life. She's always dealt with depression, which has been undiagnosed until recently, with alcohol. Alcohol is a serious issue here, Judge. And I think it's more shame in these PSIs, why things aren't coming out the way they should. But I do think she needs... Okay, I, honestly, the first time I heard it, I thought he said she's been a nasty this community. <laughs> I really did. Help for sobriety. She needs help for mental health. She needs physical help. And the letter she wrote to the victim, I don't believe, and speaking to her, that she knew the extent of the damage she did to this man. There was alcohol involved here. This was a tragic accident, but no way is Andrea Rothney an intentional problem to your community. She's a person who needs help. She needs it in an abundance of ways that I just outlined. Based on all that, Judge, I'm going to ask for mercy and say, please don't send her to jail. She does live in Washington County. I think Washtenaw County may be able to help her with sobriety if she doesn't fit into this court because she's not a resident. Oh, yeah, dump her on Simpson. That, that, that ought to be interesting. My whole agenda here from day one has been to try to get her help, the help she needs. And I knew in speaking to her initially, there were some things that were undiagnosed. I can't stress enough that there is some mental health issues that have been expedited with these physical injuries. So in no way is she a threat to society, Your Honor. She's more a threat to herself. And I think she, these issues can be corrected. But I don't think... That is a bold argument after you see the pictures. Putting a physically unable woman who's going to be a senior citizen and a grandmother that has no assaultive behavior into a jail cell is the right remedy. So for that, I ask for mercy on those issues. She's five years younger than me, so I'm not sure how that all plays out. Ooh, that, that's not the response you're looking for. He, he's like, oh, this, you can't you can't uh, jail this poor old grandma. I don't know. She's younger than me. <laughs> and I'm here working. But, uh, Andrew, what was your graduation year? 77? 79. 79. Um, we'll go next to Miss Davis. She wants to do some uh, input and some screen sharing here. Yeah, we will. Deborah, what would you like me to know? Well, I, I would say that Mr. Van Tassel was intending to be here. He's been at everything thus far, uh, but he had an emergency with his mother, and so he's not able to be here today. Um, I checked with our victim advocate. I said, what does he want to do? And she said, just go forward. So we just kind of have that conversation right now. Um, you know, this has been extremely debilitating to him, which was outlined in Mr. Friesen's report. Um, and if the court would add me in, I can share a couple of these photos that I think may be helpful. Yeah, you can't trust the grandma. So here's, here's, here's. Oh. There, let me turn up my speaker. Um, this is one of the apples, obviously. 
Andrew, is this your car? Yes, it is. And then <coughs> that is Mr. Van Tassel's vehicle. Mr. Van Tassel's vehicle. This gentleman was simply driving. He, it's an unusual curve. I'm sure your owner is aware of that. Well, as you know, we've had a, about five cases right in this very uh, stretch of roadway. This particular curve, the Hoffman curve, is quite notorious. Uh, Mr. Sussdorf's case was about half a mile or a mile from here. Uh, Mr. Taylor wasn't too far from here. The man that was hit by the mirror and seriously injured was in this same stretch of roadway. And there was one more, Matt and I were talking to, within a mile either way of this, immediately coming to mind are several other very serious accidents. This curve is particularly bad. Um, it goes in a wide right curve and then it goes straight. Hoffman goes off to the south and then off to the east goes Bullock Road. And then there's another road that is a left turn and that turns into a dirt road. So it's a, it's a bad intersection. Uh, but and, uh, and I, I think it's important for the record to be clear as to how this case transpired. And, you know, when this came to our office as a warrant request, it, it certainly appeared to be that her blood alcohol was a 0 0.015, which made sense with her claim that she had had one drink with dinner or something to that effect. It wasn't until after the plea was entered and uh, probation officer Frazine started kind of digging into this more uh, that it became clear that there, there might be an issue with the conversion. So I was able to get a hold of Deputy Jennings um, and figure out where he had gotten this conversion. They called the lab directly. The lab had given the conversion um, per one milliliter instead of per 100 milliliter, which is how it's measured. So when you do the correct conversion, her blood alcohol was a 0.15 as hospital blood. So um, with the conversion of hospital blood then, um, obviously it could be slightly lower than that, but at any rate, she was extremely intoxicated uh, by the standards of our law. Anything over 0.08 is considered presumed intoxicated. So I guess what, what truly bothers me about this in the letter that she wrote to Mr. Van Tassel, which he has not yet read, he has not chosen to read that yet. Um, he intended to get a copy of it and, and read it if he, if he felt so inclined uh, when he got here today. But part of that says very clearly that she wanted him to know that she did not feel the least bit intoxicated or impaired. That is very concerning. I don't know if she's trying to justify why she drove or I, I don't know, but to say that when this is your second time in a short period of years having an OWI with endangerment of a person and as Mr. Frizine also checked and, and I checked as well with the probation department down in Indiana, she did not tell the truth to Mr. Frazine about having a 0.03 blood alcohol in Indiana. It was a 0.09. So again, that's you know over the legal limit in Michigan as well. So I don't know what to do with her. Um, I do know that as is outlined in the PSI, Mr. Van Tassel's life has been significantly altered. Yes, insurance paid for things. It, it, great, but there's things insurance doesn't cover. It doesn't cover the fact that he can't walk without a cane now and, and he feels like he's old and crippled and he used to be able to do the things that he loves to do. Um, this is this is very serious and the reason that um, the defendant gave for drinking and the fact that she was going to go care for somebody in their home, be an in-home caregiver, 
at that level of intoxication is extremely scary. Uh, this is behavior that we cannot tolerate. We cannot just let this go. I understand that she's got significant injuries herself. It's the product of the choices she made, but she's not too frail or too injured to be incarcerated. And in cases like this, I think incarceration is expected. It's something that 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 deterrent so that people don't make the same choice that she made. And with that, I think that the recommendation is is certainly uh, on par with what I would say. So uh, with that, I would leave it to the court's discretion. Um, and I would say that when I did speak with the victim at the last court hearing, he did think that there should be some jail time as part of this. So uh, certainly, you know, we keep him informed of everything that's going on and he's been here from the beginning. Um, it definitely was something where he thought, yeah, she seemed intoxicated uh, on the day of the accident. So I'm glad that it was brought to light and it didn't get swept under the rug or missed because of a faulty uh, conversion from the lab. And well, it wasn't faulty. It was just misreported. It, it was misreported. It says 0. 0.15 in the report. The lab report says 0.15. The officer typed 0. 0.015, but that would have had a great red flag. It was misreported by the officer. The, the lab report says 0. 0.15. The police report says 0. 0.15, and then he says it was converted to 0.015. Right. Well, that would have caused a giant red flag right at the opening bell. And because it was in deciliters instead of milliliters. So when the officer called the lab and talked to the head of the lab, they said, oh, well, when you convert it to milliliters, then it's 0.015. He didn't process that that would be. Well, I'm not blaming him. Milliliters. Well, right, I'm You saying. guys authorized it. And there was a lab report that said 0.15, and the police report said 0.15. He didn't understand what he was doing, but um, it, it was, it got mixed up in translation. I guess I'll leave it at that. But uh, it was unfortunate it took so long to figure it out. I'm sorry, go ahead. That's okay. I mean, it just, at the end of the day, we, we would leave it to the court's discretion based on what's in the pre-sentence report, which I think was very thorough. Thank you. All right. There's a, as I said to Matt, there's also a, I don't know if it's a pink, well, there's a couple of them. There's dancing pink elephants. Miss Rothy, now that you're recuperating from this that terrible accident, you're on a bunch of medication, but you were on medications at the time of this accident. Um, so I have a concerns about what was in her bloodstream in addition to alcohol. Uh, this was hospital blood. I don't know whether they analyzed for anything else, but you were on a course of antidepressants and other medication at the time of the accident uh, last May, and that isn't even reflected, but it would affect your ability to safely operate a vehicle. So in addition to the fact that you had two times the lawful blood alcohol level, I don't know what else you had in your system, but I believe you also had your prescribed medications that you were taking, which are probably contraindicated to alcohol. Um, both Matt, and we'll hear from them, and Daniel struggled with trying to get to the center of the universe trying to figure out what happened. And on some things, you have a very clear recollection, and then when you get to what you need to know, you don't remember anything. So let's back up. You went out to your friend John's house off Stolt Road. Now, who was that person? He's just a casual friend. What's his name? John Rice. All right, I know him. He also goes to trivia. And his dog died. Yeah. And so you went out there to console him. Yes. And you were coming back from there to go back home and then theoretically to work. Yes. Where, where was the uh, person you were caring for? Where did they live? In Northside, Kansas. 
So what everyone is struggling with here, including me, is rectifying the blood alcohol level and your adamant representation that you only had one beer. No, 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 we're, we're not struggling. She's lying. Because the two things don't <laughs> reconcile. Um, and we don't have the normal things we would have in a drinking driving case. We don't have field sobriety tests. We don't have uh, a PBT. Um, now, I'm sure there are probably ambulance reports and some other reports that I don't have. But you were yourself in distress. You were seriously injured. The other car was upside down. It was about to catch fire. You got transported to Kalamazoo. So no one said, well, this lady seemed intoxicated or disoriented or smelled of alcohol because you would probably would be disoriented because you were just in a serious collision. So it isn't until we get to the hospital Seriously. that they analyze your blood and we find it's two times the limit plus whatever else was in your system at that time. Um, the man first said, I think she should get the maximum sentence. Someone's driving drunk and they hit me uh, and almost killed me. And then you take great pains to tell him you weren't drunk. I didn't feel impaired at all by the alcohol I drank, uh, which is a source of frustration for Daniel. He says, just give her 60 days in jail. She doesn't admit she has a problem. She doesn't acknowledge anything more than one drink. She writes this letter, which sort of apologizes, but then also says, I wasn't really intoxicated. And I'm gonna give you some hard news here. I've seen you drunk on multiple occasions. Uh-oh. Um, you would make people uncomfortable. At Don't you hate it when you live in such a small town that the judge observes your uh, naughty adventures? I mean, it's not good. <laughs> it's really a bummer. At trivia, because you would be someone who was intoxicated that was pretending they weren't. This may be a revel revelation to you. But people would try to avoid you because you would come up and and it was obvious that you were intoxicated. I can think of three occasions, twice at Brewster's and once at Kelsey Block Brewery, where I saw you and I didn't want to talk to you. You probably don't have any memory of this. My trivia partner said, oh, that your name was Miss Michigan. Uh, oh. And it's like, you know, she's in rough shape. And so that is the persona that you had that you aren't even aware of. And um, you had that previous incident in, South, in Indiana where you minimized it and said you're minding your own business and they pulled me over for no reason. And then they find out what the real deal is. Everybody in here understands you have an alcohol problem, but you um, and your lawyer alluded to it. There's some shame to it, and it's a big pill to swallow. But this incident almost killed somebody, um, and he was advocating for the maximum jail sentence. Matt said this. He said, the sheriff doesn't want her in our jail. Um, she's got plenty of problems of her own. You're also on a number of medications, including opioids. And um, there is not a good fit. So having just blasted you with that, what do you want to say to me? I'm interested in your take on all this. <clears throat> One thing when I had the first when I had the first call with the probation office with Dan Prezine, um, the only advice I had from my attorney was whatever you do, don't don't talk about that you had alcohol. And um, at that time it wasn't part of the charges. So he asked me about it and I 
All right, that makes some sense. You didn't know what to do. All right, so tell me now what was really going on. And then the second conversation, um, I, I admit that sometimes in the afternoon, because that was my downtime in the day, so in the early afternoon, because I was working 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. shifts, um, that sometimes I would be taking it easy and I'd have a glass of wine, maybe two glasses of wine. Um, but he covered this. He said he didn't want the case, but he knows everybody in the county. I mean, you know, the, if 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 the standards, you just have some some uh, knowledge of the person. He he, he couldn't roll on anything in St. Joseph County. Uh, they told me that I would have to have had five to seven glasses of wine, of you know, liquor, alcohol, some description, before I even got to John's, where I had the one beer. Um, and I I honestly don't don't remember doing that. I don't think of myself as that level of drinker. So perhaps I'm just strongly in denial. Well, there's an additional factor. You were grieving. I mentioned your mom worked at the bank. Your dad was in the German band. I think he used to be in Kalanis. You lost both of your parents in a short time. Parents that you'd been caring for. He knows her parents club affiliations I, I mean you can't get anything done around here for some time uh your parents were active in the presbyterian church your family's well thought of you were grieving you weren't taking it easy you were drowning your sorrows and you were day drinking at your house then you went out to the friend's house, and I don't know what happened, but bear in mind, this is also while you're on all your medications, and you were going to go to work in Kalamazoo. Now, I've seen this many times. I had a young girl who was on her way to her first day on the job. Her first day at work, she was a 1-7. Um, I have someone you know who's involved in community theater might have even been in some productions with her she was on her way to work oh good lord in constantine uh, with a very high blood alcohol level um you got it bad and you need to accept that because ain't nothing going to get better until you do there's no shame and I'm the sobriety court guy, and I've been a judge for 22 years, and I was a prosecutor for 23 years. So I estimate I've seen between 12 and 15,000 drunk drivers. Um, and no two are exactly alike, but I just told you about a couple where I saw some similarities with your situation. Um, you're very intelligent, um, you're underemployed, you have a very impressive resume for the things that you've done both at work and volunteer, and I think you expect it to be in a different place in your life than where you are right now, even before the accident. So. A lot of my day drinkers drink vodka. Um, a current bane is women and wine. There's a whole culture about it. Um, for older adult ladies and wine. Um, but you had a lot going on here, and your either dishonest or mistaken belief that you weren't impaired is from an alternate universe. You had a 0.15 blood alcohol level. You were on your medications, which are contraindicated for alcohol, and you almost killed this guy. Granted, this is a terrible intersection, but it also points out why you shouldn't be operating a vehicle while you're intoxicated. And you were intoxicated. 
and you had a previous charge of the same thing. I had a man recently who was a veteran. He hit a veteran. He was going the wrong way on 131 in front of Myers. And he hit a man head on. This was in the last few months. And um, caused debilitating injuries to that man. And uh, the guy was very forgiving. He also had a service dog, and it did some things to a service dog. And uh, I did a 30-day sentence. And some people are like, he only got 30 days? He also had a prior. He was very drunk. Uh, there are some issues about Social Security disability. If you incarcerate somebody longer than 30 days, they lose their disability benefits. So um, there are other extrajudicial things to consider. Um, and how much is enough? Is five days enough? Is 365 days enough? At what point during that sentence does the light turn on? We can't get your light to turn on. Um, you don't understand. Of course, now that you've been injured. That got me for some reason. Um, alcohol is really contraindicated. When is the last time you had a glass of wine? I'm trying to remember. I'm taking uh, pain meds right now from okay. surgery. So, so you're not supposed to drink any wine. So I'm hopeful that you're not. But was that a surprise to you, what I told you, that people would see you coming and they want to go the other way? Yes. Uh, if you had someone that was honest with you that you know, they would tell you that. Um, I've seen it myself. Debbie's not buying any of this either. I mean, she's half poor, but but to the extent she she's she, she zones back in, just because the judge is taking a while, she is not buying anything this woman's saying. Um, and I always wondered how you got home from there. So it brings us back to the question, uh, what do we do? Daniel, you spent a lot of time on this. This probation department probably spent more time on this case than any other case this year. Oh, for and sure, this year, for sure. Uh, between you and Matt, um, what's your thought? <clears throat> well, just some things that I want to emphasize is um, that curve, obviously, is, you saw the damage to the car. Um, it was very dangerous driving. And the gentleman that I spoke with, Mr. Van Tassel, I think he might disagree that as far as the statement that was made that she's not a threat to society, um, I would think he'd have a strong disagreement with that, um, being that he can no longer do the hiking and some of the other sports and activities that he was uh, very active, um, and actually, he's actually te he talked, and he was angry, but he was very cordial about it. So I was really actually impressed about how cordial he'd be, and I would hope that I would be that cordial about the situation. But he was very uh, upset. I'm actually glad that he hasn't read the letter, because I, quite honestly, I was embarrassed about the letter when I read it. I thought it was more of a "Yeah, I hit you," but um, I didn't think there was the kind of ownership that I wanted to see in there, and I don't think any of that has to do with an unawareness. Um, I think she was obviously knew that she had some depression prior to this accident. Um, that's why she was on the medication. I I think that there's been people in jail that have been in wheelchairs before. Um, I'm not saying that's the best fit, but I think with everything that was said, the dishonesty about the previous um, drunk driving, which was a similar in nature, the fact that she was 1-5, that she went through a corner that you should be slowing down if you're going to transition on the bullock, and she obviously hit that at a high rate of speed. The fact that she didn't feel intoxicated is scary, and that she was going to go take care of uh, an elderly person on way on the other side of um, Kalamazoo. I think that this, I was pretty generous with the 60 days, um, I think, but I also don't think that just putting her in jail and being done because she's going to be back on the road at some point. So I think that a, a pro, uh, probation is appropriate and a long-term probation, but I think there has to be a jail consequence in this, uh, a component in this case. 
Well, she isn't a fit for our sobriety court, you know, because um, she doesn't live here. So how do we do a probation if she doesn't live here? I've had probationers with, in California. I just had to coordinate with stuff in Ann Arbor and do, set up testing in Ann Arbor. I'd be willing to take that on just to have some sort of a monitoring and to help her in the process afterwards. Can I add something briefly, Your Honor? Certainly. Um, as far as probation goes, because she is a Washtenaw County resident, what they usually do in these situations is they'll have, like, you'll be her supervisor, but she'll have a probation officer that's local that will actually report to you. I don't know if that works here. Well, we've I done it. Here. We've had some difficulty. We've, we've traded sobriety court cases uh, with other counties. I know Judge Burke. I went to law school with Judge Tavi. Anyway, I know the judges in Ann Arbor. And we've tried to transfer some sobriety court cases in the past. And at that time, they didn't take anybody that was at U of M. They didn't do any good luck with students. We didn't explore putting her in Ann Arbor sobriety court. Uh, but the fact that she didn't acknowledge that she had any problem, Matt is not recommending sobriety court anyway. So, A, we could supervise the sobriety court remotely, or we could supervise the probation by telephone or by video, set up testing and treatment. But right now, she's not really appropriate for testing, or well, maybe testing, but she's on prescribed pain medication, which she needs. She's recovering herself. Um, Ms. Curtis, what's your prognosis? Are they hoping that at some point you'll be able to get off this walker, get back to a, nor a more normal life? More normal, yes, sir. Um, the surgery I just had on Monday was to take all the metal out of my leg. My leg had not been healing well, and they're hoping this will help. Where do you live in Ann Arbor? On the west side of the city. Why Ann Arbor? My significant other is there. All right. And that's this gentleman? He's here. All yeah. right. And what's in Traverse City? I own a house in Traverse City. Um, I still maintain part of it as my residence, but I have spent a lot of time down here over those years caring for my parents. All right. Why Traverse City? I, I had lived there when I was young, and when I moved back from Germany, um, I chose Traverse City where to settle. I think your dad worked for the phone company. And got Traverse City is awesome. Uh, that's where I grew up, but it's uh, it's a long way away from here. Uh, transfer of time. You lived in different towns? Yeah, I lived in different towns growing up. Because of the phone company? We mm -hmm. moved a lot. And then when you were in high school, you moved to Three Rivers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, one yes. more brief thing, if I may. A big part of Agent Francine's report is that she didn't contact the victim. Well, you could put that on me, Your Honor. I never have a defendant as a bond violation. There's always a no contact, which is always presumed. She did want to contact the victim, but I would not allow her to do so. So that's and, my fault, Judge. No, it's not a matter of fault. It's probably routine. Right until the conviction enters. So that was a theme um, of the report, but clearly um, that was just legal advice but, there, Judge. And if I were you, I'd give the same advice. Right. So, but you know, she says in her letter, after I talked to Daniel, um, but he never actually saw the letter. Mr. Van Tassel has yeah. not received it yet. Why not? I don't exactly know why he said that he didn't know if he wanted to read it and so he was just going to get a copy today when he came in and decide whether he wanted to read it or not well the, but, van, the van tassels have lived at corey lake for 50 years 70 years and he's probably been up down this road a bunch of times himself um it's just very can i say just one more thing i mean this accident happened in may of 21 yes so it's been a year and a half the fact that the defendant was still drinking up until recently is so disheartening to me. Like if I 
driving drunk and nearly killed a person, and I had a prior driving drunk just a few years before, I don't think I'd want to, like, where's the treatment? Where's a year and a half? Has she done any alcohol treatment, or are we just, like, well, there was some mention of AA, uh, but, but what is drinking? I don't know what going to AA is really helping. <laughs> And let me just, you can answer that obviously, but one thing, Judge, she wrote a note to me when you were telling her about trivia night. Mm -hmm. I don't think she's realized, when I first got the case, I didn't think alcohol was a component until there was an amendment, looking at the initial report, et cetera. Now, with that being stated, when you were mentioning trivia night, she was giving me notes over here saying she was kind of shocked. I think it was kind of a wake-up call for her. You said everybody else in the room understands she has a drinking problem. I think she's starting to realize that now because she was extremely embarrassed when you were telling her that story, which I never knew, that she was harassing people under the... Well, she was harassing them. Or annoying people. Annoying would be okay. a better term. Because this is an educated woman. Uh, you really, the best part of it right here is, of course, Deborah. She she is she is want, wanting to crawl out of her skin right now. She led a relatively good life. To learn what she learned today in court <laughs> is humbling. She didn't know that was a situation where people respected your community see her at a trivia night she enjoys going to and she can't control her alcohol abuse. There are mental health issues, there are physical issues here, Judge, but I think this hearing alone is a strong wake up call that she realizes there's a problem now. She didn't do well at her probation interviews, but when you mentioned the trivia night, that seemed to have an effect on her that she was shocked to learn that. I mean, to be fair though, she knew alcohol was a situation when this accident happened. There's no way she didn't know alcohol was a factor. I think he said that the first meeting was like, hey, you don't don't mention alcohol. But again, if these trivia nights were within that last year and a half. No, no, this would be. No. Okay, so before yeah, that. Before, prior to the accident. All right, but, but again, still, she knows that there was alcohol in her system. And it, I guess. You know, Judge Middleton's cleaning up that up too. She was just a hot mess at these trivia nights. I mean, like even his description, which is bad, is not nearly as bad as the reality. I guarantee it. Well, I had another defendant who also went to three years high school, and I told him the same thing. I said, "You got an alcohol problem." In fact, I told him ten years ago. He didn't acknowledge that denial. Then he got arrested for drunk driving. He still contended he had an alcohol problem. And I had him sit down with Matt and watch the video of his behavior at the time of his arrest. And I think the light finally went on. So she's been in such denial for so long, it's hard to change her thinking. Sir, do you wish to offer anything? Um, Larry, come up with a question. If you come right up to the podium, if you would. And tell the judge who you are, et cetera. I'm Ernst Kastenbaum. Uh, I live in Sido Township, just west of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I'm the county clerk and registry of deeds for Washington County. And uh, Andrea uh, has been living with me for the last approximately year. I'm also surprised to hear the things that were said in court today. Um, at the time that you knew her at these trivia nights, I did not know her at that time. But I've known Andrea for now since March of 21. So uh, over a year and a half. And um, so just before the accident. Yeah, no, a few, yeah, a couple months ago. The and then, um, she had the accident, and I, I rushed over to Kalamazoo to the hospital there. And, uh, um, but I had not observed her to abuse alcohol or to be intoxicated. In my experience with her in the last you know, year, almost two years. Um, but uh, I'm not, and next, I, I drink little myself. There's I don't have alcoholism in, in my family, uh, so I might not recognize things. That's true, but um, but my observation of her over the you know has not been uh, that she's someone who has a severe problem. I know that she has many severe 
physical and mental issues um, even before the accident, and, and especially since the accident. Um, and uh, but that's uh, uh, and I know that she's had a, she's had a very hard time with a number of different things that happened through her parents taking care of her parents, her parents' deaths over a short period of time, uh, having to basically abandon her life in Traverse City to come down to Three Rivers, take care of her parents for five years. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, when I came into the situation, uh, um, I had, I, I had, uh, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm not, an expert on yeah, any of those these issues about substance abuse. Uh, it's not been my problem or any of the, but the, um, I have, I have, I have not observed her to be a toxic. Well, agent. that's helpful, but I'm interested in pre-accident and post-accident. And what I was talking with you about is pre-accident. And, and we sort of hit this. I think there was a lot of grieving going on at this time too. A absolutely, and, you know, grieving, and also, you know, the the circumstances surrounding her father's death were deeply infuriating to her, as well as grief. You know, that she felt like her father was mistreated uh, in the in the in his last months of life, and uh, and that was something that continues to upset her. Um, and and I, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for that. But, the, the, um, but you're right that the, the large majority of all the time I've known her had been since the accident. I, you know, she did not live with me before the accident. That happened only later. Well, it sounds like you're a very stabilizing factor in her life, which is a, certainly a positive. All right, thank you for being here. Um, Andrea, I'm going to give you, you can have a seat, thank you. The last word, is there anything else you want to tell me? I guess I see that I have been just in complete denial, not understanding what you, what you said. I have very little since the accident because on and off with different surgeries I've taken, um, you know, I don't know, and stuff, you, you don't drink well, that. Well, let me ask this. You've got adult children who are all very successful. For that, you should be commended, because I think you did most of that on your own. But they got to see this. I'd be interested to know if the kids know mom's got a problem and she's mixing wine with her medications. And um, so... I'm just a casual person that lives in the same town, and I can see it. Can't imagine what people close to you are seeing. But I cut you off, so let me let you finish. My oldest daughter has talked to me about drinking. She has thought I did too much, and it's made a difference that she said that to me. Also, the tox screens at the time of the accident were, there was nothing there at all. They did run everything, not just alcohol. Um, yeah, I have not seen myself in this way before. And I also did not know until yesterday when I got a document I hadn't seen before, the extent of Mr. Van Tassel's injuries. I thought they were much less severe. There is a $600 cash bond in here. We'll put all the fines in the drinking driving case. There's a $75 crime victim's rights fee, a $50 state minimum fee, $100 screening fee. I am going to order 12 month probation which is $480. Is there a police reimbursement, Deborah? Yes, I believe it is because there's an accident and a blood draw, 255. Sheriff's Department. Yes, they just got a Sheriff's Department. Daniel is recommending the victim impact panel. 
should have Mr. Fantasel be a speaker at the Victim Impact Panel. Substance Abuse Counseling and Treatment as Directed, Testing as Directed. We're going to do it from here. We'll do it by video or by phone. We'll set up testing in Ann Arbor. No alcohol, no controlled substances. 60 days, credit zero. So the 60 days, 30 are deferred. You're going to jail for 30 days. There you have it. Which is going to be painful for you and the sheriff. As I said, I don't know what the right number is. 365? 30 days in jail is going to be very difficult for you to do. This is, as Daniel pointed out, a second offense. It was a serious debilitating injury and accident. You were going to go to work. This was a giant wake-up call. And on the impairment of the bodily function, 30 days. Oops. Zero. Daniel, I'm going to schedule that, or Matt, I'm not sure who's responsible for it at this point. Um, I agree with Daniel. I think we need some sort of ongoing supervision here to keep her away from alcohol. But she's on opioids, which she needs for pain, which also makes treatment court difficult. Zero fine and cost. Thank you, Michelle. Andrea, I take zero joy in this. Um, some people will think this is too much, and some people will think this isn't enough. But I'm the one that has to make the tough decision. I want you to go with Daniel. He's going to get you started as to what the terms of your probation are. You're going to do 30 days in a row. If it comes back that a sheriff doesn't want to do it that way, I'd hate to do 15 weekends. I'd like this to be a straight sentence. But if they've got a compelling reason, we've got discretion to amend it because she is on probation. All right. Thank, Thank you. you all for your input. Thank you. It's a very difficult case. Mr. Mario, you don't get out here very much, but you'd be welcome to come back here uh, at any time. Thank you, George. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Do you have to see here for a while? Or? All right. Sir, it's nice to talk to you. Go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go back with Dan. Hold the for Stephen. Dodge it, Bill. I'll talk to Larry, okay? I love this so you can see she's not in good shape. Well, there you have it. Not, not, not as uh, humorous as our usual uh, clips, but I thought it was really interesting. I, I watched that, and I was wondering the whole time what Judge Middleton was going to do. I'm happy she got 30 days. I, I would have given more, but I understand where he's coming from. And he also has other constraints, like she, she's going to be very difficult to deal with at the jail. But uh, 30, yeah, I mean, you, you can quibble about it. Who knows what to do? But 30 days is, that, that's that's a, a real sentence uh, that that should be, a, that should get your attention to, to spend a month of your life in jail, especially um, injured and, you know, with, with the injuries that you've caused yourself. I mean, you know, it's, I, I don't know. I don't know what injury she caused the other guy, but apparently they're pretty significant. And uh, and and this isn't her first incident. So, you know, I would like to see him a little bit more, but I can't really argue with it. He did give a significant jail sentence. I don't know. I don't know. All right, let, let, let me go find some funny ones. That 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 one's too mellow. I couldn't even I couldn't even squeeze in my thruple clip today. I couldn't. It was, I just thought it would be in poor taste. <laughs> but I, I wanted to just drop it in the middle to, to lighten it up a little bit. All right, Clint, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out. I will see you all soon.